Hello, everyone. We'll give it a one more minute for folks to come into the webinar and then we'll get started. We are so excited to have everyone join us on this Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, we're just going to give it one more minute and then we are so excited about this in-depth discussion around policy and economy. Hey, Keisha, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to see everyone today on this great Thursday. My name is Keisha Danarine. I am the Director of Opportunity, Race, and Justice for the NAACP, and I work under the strategy team. I am so excited that everyone is here um, participating in this amazing call around policy and uh, economy. So we know that policy and economy fit hand in hand on how we continue to fight for the rights of the future of Black workers. And so I want to give you a little bit of context and background about what we do on the strategy team and how we are able to fight for the rights of people, particularly Black and Brown people across our country. So as the Director of Inclusive Economy, I focus on and believe in two things. Hands down, it's not only a personal moral compass of mine, but it's something we do here at work. And the first is the fight for access access to capital, reparations, an opportunity to work on urban, um, urban and community renewal, revitalization, and how we look at the ways that we continue to provide resources to Black and Brown people across our country. And a big part of that economy, the big part of the infrastructure is labor. So we know, without a doubt, bridging the racial wealth divide and having conversations about generational wealth is extremely important since Black and Brown people are four generations removed from generational wealth because of all of the issues that we have surfaced in our country. Redlining, mass incarceration, um, capitalism, all of the things that continue to count against us. So what is a way that we can continue to fight for the rights of economy? The first is, continuing to push for living wage, not just fair wage, living wage. How can we continue to stimulate our economy and give people the right amount of money and more money than that in order to provide for their family? The second is benefits. So we know more than anyone that we have the ability to continue to push for benefits because we need people to be well, we need people to feel safe, mental health is a big deal, and we wanna give people those opportunities. The third is protection rights to people having clean jobs and being protected in those jobs, not feeling like there's retaliation, not fighting against that particular person who wants to speak out, but having the ability to protect those people because they have a right to be heard. And then the biggest thing out of all of this is, how do we continue to work with not only our corporate partners, but our union partners, and how we can continue to mobilize, advocate, policy around changing the outcomes for black and brown people. So a little bit of an example of what I do, and, and these are three things that I really wanted to feature to you all today is, as you know, the NAACP is partnered with CWA in regards to fighting for the rights of Maximus workers. So we know Maximus is a federal call center that's federally funded. And we do know with all of the reports that we've received that those folks are being discriminated against. They're not being treated fairly. Progress or job promotion is not a thing. And we wanna to continue to advocate for those rights. So we are fighting these federal contracts to be held with equity. And a second great example is at convention this year, if you all came to our NAACP convention, we are super excited and happy that you came. We partnered with SAG-AFTRA and on our convention Labor Day, uh, during our labor luncheon, we had an amazing support system that came to our convention, fought for the rights of SAG-AFTRA and we are a huge supporter of their work. And so none of this also cannot be possible with two folks that I'd like to absolutely give um, 
comments and, and compliments too. And the first is Lindsey Walker. He is our program manager for Inclusive Economy. He's done all the coordination for this call. The second is our leader, Yamika Rushing, who is our chief of strategy. And we are so honored to work under her leadership. And we cannot continue to do this work nationally without Chairwoman Robin Williams, who is our chair of our National Labor Committee and Vice Chair Ray Curry. We are so honored to have their leadership. So now I'm really excited to introduce our panelists because I know you all are really excited to hear this conversation and so am I. So I'm gonna tell you a little about them. And if you want to learn more, we have a Labor Action Week site that we'll put in the chat so you can read their whole bios. So the first is this very impressive woman. Her name is Dr. Candace Archer. She is our policy, or not our policy, she is a policy director at the AFL-CIO. She manages a team of policy experts who advocate for unions and workers' rights. And what's even more impressive about Dr. Archer is prior to joining AFL-CIO, she was a university professor and taught classes and published on political economy. So Dr. Archer, I just want to let you know, I use APA. You should be proud of me. And so that's, how, that's my writing. And the second is we are so honored to have, and oh my gosh, she is such a gem in all of her acting career. So we are so honored to have Michelle Hurd. Michelle Hurd is an impressive, impressive person as she has multiple titles. So I'm going to try to say this and I hope I get it right just to give her the honor that she deserves. But she is sag as National Board Vice President of Los Angeles. She is sag as National Government Affairs and Public Policy Committee. And she's also the national, she runs the National Sexual Harassment Prevention Committee. She's chair of that. So that, if not alone, is impressive. We have a lot to learn from her today. So she currently has been seen starring opposite of Patrick Stewart in Paramount's Star Trek Picard. And she recently completed production on the Will Gluck rom-com, Anyone But You, with Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell. And so we're really excited to have Michelle and hear her views from sag -Aftra. And now we have Fed Ingram. He's a veteran, so I cannot wait to hear what he's going to bring to the table around this long-standing work that he's been doing in union. So he is the secretary treasurer of the American Federation of Teachers, AFT, and has been serving 1.7 million members, including pre-K to 12th grade teachers. And he also has a background as the past president of the 140 members Florida Education Association. So Fed is in deep. He's union-based. We want to hear from him. And he has been doing this a long time and represents one of the largest unions in the country. And then I am really excited to, to actually introduce who's moderating this panel. She is a dear friend and a mentor of mine. And I am so honored to have her here. Her name is Patrice Willoughby. She is our, so see that Dr. Archer, she's our, our Senior Vice President of Global Policy and Impact. She is 20 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, executive branch, private sector, and she has applied racial equity lens and advocacy in all financial space, including tax and technology. I will also say she's one of the sweetest people, and I am so honored to be working with her. And so without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Patrice Willoughby to moderate this wonderful panel in regards to policy and um, economy. One last thing, if anyone would like to leave some Q&A, we will have about one or two, two minutes in the at the end to do that. So please go ahead in your Q&A box. It's on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Go ahead and put some Q&As that we would like to turn over to Patrice and Lindsay to ask. But other than that, Patrice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Keisha. And thank you to our uh, esteemed panelists for being here this evening. Uh, thank you to our guests for joining us for this evening's discussion. Um, as we all know, there are so many benefits to uh, working within a unionized work environment. And indeed, the growth uh, in the economic strength of Black and Brown communities over the past 100 years has really arisen under union membership. Um, however, there are a lot of anti-equity movements that are going on in the United States. The union, union membership has declined at a time when, with globalization, trade agreements, union membership is more important than ever for economic stability uh, and the rights of workers. With that as the backdrop, um, we know that as we advocate for workers, um, labor needs help as well as 
uh, individuals need help to know how to connect with unions um, and understand the benefits of union membership. Um, I would love to have you speak to how the labor industry has changed within the past 25 years and how these changes need to be reflected in federal policy um, as lawmakers consider how to uh, buttress union membership. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, my industry, SAG-AFTRA, the actors industry has changed uh, monumentally over the last 25 years. I mean, it's insane. You know, uh, back in the day, um, actors and writers um, could make a living doing this beautiful, sacred art form that has really been around for centuries. You know, the art form of storytelling, uh, the necessity of um, keeping a history of uh, what we all go through. This during the pandemic, I'm sure everybody realized how they leaned into watching uh, stories and um, all the different movies and television series and reading books. And it really is sort of a life saver of, uh, uh, um, you know, in art. And it sounds sort of hyperbolic, but it's true. This is literally something that is keeps us all human <laughs> and connected. And my industry um, has been sort of, um, I've been saying this of late that our strike, the SAG after what the WGA strike, is kind of like a microcosm of what's happening in the labor world right now. We're sort of these shiny objects that you can sort of see and go, oh, look, those actors are yelling. But what we're yelling about is about labor, about working class, about the ability and the right to make an honest, fair living, to be compensated for our work. Back in the day when we had linear television, you know, 22 episodes, 24 episodes, you guys all know it. Um, it was ad supported. You would have us, you know, you see the show, the commercial show, commercial show. Now we have these streaming platforms where in the complete model of this business that we all, you know, bought into has changed. Not with a discussion, not with any kind of agreement, not with any kind of heads up, literally got changed in, in the middle of, the, of, of uh, you know, flipping the script, as they say. And this concept of residuals has disappeared because these streaming platforms have told us that there's just no way to track it. However, every time you guys turn on any of those pro those streaming platforms, you'll see that they say, this is the number one show or the number one film on this platform. Well, how do they know that? How do they know that? They know it because they can track the eyes. Now, this is where we would normally get residuals. We have been denied residu residuals now. At this point, Oh, and another fabulous thing, our caps for our health and pension have not changed for 40 years, 40 years since 1983. That doesn't go along with any concept of inflation. Nothing has mimicked anything to, to uh, uh, mimic a, a honest or uh, livable wage when you have something that doesn't change for 40 years. We also, there's something called a um, a top of show, which the AMPTP, which is the America, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Production, which is the people, the group that we are negotiating with, SAG-AFTRA and WGA, they have something that they have coined called top of show, which is now the base minimum paycheck, the base minimum that they will pay you and they will not budge. So they will literally say, if you want to be on the show, you will have the base minimum. And I tell you this because one of the things that is so confusing about um, our strike is that there's a concept of actors being these sort of rich elitist people, right? That we're living in penthouses and we got yachts and I don't know, Rolls Royces or something. Well, let me make this very clear. SAG-AFTRA has 160,000 members, proud members. That consists of voiceover artists, singers, dancers, stunt artists, background artists, and principal artists. 98% of that 160,000 make basically less than $12 an hour. 87% of that 160,000 cannot qualify for our health insurance, which is 26,000 a year, 26,000 a year. And the reason that is, is because this top of show, this base minimum paycheck that I'm forced to take if I want a job. And I'm talking about all of the TV shows that you guys watch. It, 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 you can name any of the TV shows on streaming platforms, on um, linear television, whatever. You'll see me, right? You may not know me. You'll say, well, oh, there's that curly hair girl, the curly girl haired actress. Or you'll say, oh, there's that guy on that show. You don't know our names, but you've seen our faces. 
And that's because we hustle from every job. So you could see me, the curly haired lady on maybe three or four guest spots on those fabulous shows that you all are watching. Any show that's in your head right now, any show, I could do four different guest spots in a year and every the public will say, oh my goodness, that curly haired actress, she is hustling, she is working, she must be famous by now, she must be rich. No, it's because I'm literally actually hustling to pin together enough money to make 26,000 in a year to qualify for my health insurance. And I could do those three or four guest spots and still not qualify. So my industry has changed exponentially. There is no more uh, a working, you know, before, well, again, a microcosm of the world. It is now the haves and the haves not. That expanse has gotten so um, untenable. And I, I speak about this often. And one of the things that I've gotten into conversation about is how 10 years ago or so in conversations, people used to talk about, oh my goodness, there are people who make millions of dollars, right? That was 10 years ago, right? Now we talk, oh my goodness, there are people who make billions of dollars. If we don't stop this bleeding of the working class in 10 years, we're going to be speaking about individuals making trillions of dollars. And if individuals are making trillions, well, then what is happening to the working class? We are underground at that point. So this is this, this movement right now. And I'm perfectly happy that sag After and WGA are the shiny objects to sort of bring forth the fact that it's imperative that labor be acknowledged right now, that the working class get compensated for their work because this is what's happening right now in our world. I've been privy to, to go to cons and meet people of different vocations and I speak about this. I have healthcare people coming over to me, teachers coming over to me, good Lord, librarians coming over to me, custodians, all types of vocations saying, we are suffering right now. We hear this, this battle, that battle is our battle. This is the time right now, you guys, 2023, it has to stop. There's, there, there cannot, it's, it's about the have yachts not the haves, the have yachts and the have nots. It's got to stop. So what you what you're outlining uh, is really also um, the shift between uh, the means of production in terms of labor to automation to AI that has been replicated oh. across industry sectors. Um, I would love to hear um, Dr. Archer. Um, and uh, Mr. Ingram uh, respond to that as well, because we're talking about an imbalance of power. You know, uh, pre previously people had the power to withhold their labor, but with shifts in technology, um, how can people, how can the labor movement help people to regain that balance of power in order to force systemic change? No, I think that you want to open it up, right? I mean, because yes. I'll keep, you guys, Absolutely. I'm an actor. I'll keep talking. So you guys jump in here. <laughs> um, I'll I'll start off and then Fed, I'll turn it over to you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that, um, that uh, Michelle hit it right on the head. And the issue is, if you look at the economy, productivity has gone up across the board, like dramatically in every industry. And um, CEO pay has gone up across the board. Um, in fact, it CEO pay is 272 uh, times that of an average worker's pay. Right? You know, Candace, just to jump in there for sure. our my industry, uh, uh, we did that same um, that same statistics. Our CEOs are now making 400 percent more than our base. Actors. Yeah, I mean that's just the average one, right? So when you're yeah. talking to those billionaires, it's it's a lot, it's a lot higher. Um the then so what we've seen is that you know CEOs corporate profits have really expanded and who's been left out has been workers. And it's not just about technology, right? There's always been um Technology has has helped in a lot of ways in a lot of industries. Uh, certainly, you know, we're using Zoom right now, which is helping, you know, inform people. We still have real live people talking about these issues and, you know, uh, having a discussion. Uh, but I think that as the economy changes, the economic structure has privileged jobs that are just, again, exactly what Michelle was saying, 
that are temporary, they're, you know, gig work, uh, whether you're the Uber driver or, you know, an actor going hustling, hustling is part of our culture of work. Um, and this has benefited corporations. So mm -hmm. there's no incentive for them to change their, the shareholders love it. It's the workers that are being left out. And that's why the labor movement is so important because it's a place where the workers can get together and say, it, it's time for us not to be left out any longer, right? Um, a number that we've been touting at the AFL-CIO all week because it's been Labor Day is that if you look at um, you know public opinion, 88%, 88% of people under 30 uh, are in favor of unions and the labor movement, mm -hmm. right? So we have this, this thing that's happening in this country, which is not just that wealth is becoming so, you know, un unequal. It's, it's been unequal for a very long time, but it's even worse. But we now have this sense that we can do something together and we can do something to, you know, um, to change that. So, and I'll, I'll let, uh, I'll let Fed take it from there. Yeah, I, I'll just jump in really quickly because I think, again, like uh, Candace said, Michelle hit everything on, on the head, and, and and there's no reason to kind of kind of kind of re, re redo what she said. But but first of all, let me give my solidarity to SAG AFTRA uh, and where you 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 all stay in the fight. Um, there are 1.7 million teachers that are behind you, bus drivers, and we're cheering you on every single day. And uh, our president Randy Weingarten has been out on the strike line. I know Liz Schuler has as well. And uh, and we will continue to do so. So you all stay, hang in there, and, uh, and and we got your back there. Um, but 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 your 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 original question started off, and and it, it said, how did how have these things changed in twenty five years? Listen, our country, our democracy is supposed to be by for and about the people, people, not mm -hmm. the person, mm -hmm. not not the CEO. And in our industry and education, not about the principal, not about the superintendent or the district director. It's about the people who make the engine move, the people who are actually doing the work, putting axe to the grind, saying we're going to do this work, one, because we love it. But two, don't take advantage of us because we love it. Mm. And, and then we have to spell this thing called organizing out and let people know that that is how you are empowered to move anything. You have to stand together. You have to stick together. You have to be in community with one another. And you have to be in solidarity with people who do the same things that you do. Um, we represent teachers uh, and healthcare workers. And you all know for decades now, we have been screaming that we've been underpaid, undervalued, disrespected. Um, and we have this top-down approach to education. And it has gotten worse, progressively worse over the last 25 years because we have things called culture wars that are made up uh, now and trying to put politics in the middle of our classrooms. Well, what we see now in the change in education is that our young people are making a conscious decision not to, to go into our classroom. We yeah. have a teacher shortage unlike anything that we've ever seen in this country. There are teachers who are leaving the profession every single day. And that is going to impact the workforce. That's going to impact our organizations. That's going to impact everything that we do in our society. And so we've got to try and fix this from the ground up. And that's why it's always good to see sag -Astra. Um, you know, I, you know, I hate that they're in this fight, but people pay attention when it's yeah. sag -Astra because it's people that they know. It's people that, and there's things that people can understand. Hey, my show is not on. And why do I have to watch these reruns? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's going on? And it makes people think right on their couch about what we're going through. And then when they see, you know, people like Michelle, who who, who are, you know, somewhat in my mind famous, uh, you know, then, 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 then it forces us to kind of grapple with everything else that's going on. Right. UAW, right. Uh, CWA, uh, all of these different fights. So we're all in the same fight. Um, and I, you know, there's an old saying, the more things uh, change, the more they say, uh, stay the same. Mm. And this is a marathon. This thing called uh, uh, justice and freedom and organizing, it's a marathon. And so it's our time to hold this baton and take it as far across the line as we possibly can. And so, you know, we have a, a bunch of beautiful people all over this country that are leading the fight. But they're doing it with blood, sweat, and tears because people can't pay rent. They don't have health care. 
they are suffering out there um, while people are getting rich around the others' work. And so we've got to put this, you know, uh, you know, Michelle said it best. This is the year, you know, you, you see people out, you see people striking, you see people organizing. This is our year and our young people are fired up. It, you know, I, I think Candace said it best. People like what's going on in unions because they like a righteous fight. They want right. to stand for something. They want values to be in the front and center of what's going on. And so we've got to utilize that. And, and then the change has got to be something that we can use to move forward to actually make the agenda by for and about the people. That's right. Oh, it's so good. So I, the, I, no, go ahead, Michelle. Please. No, I, you, say, I, you guys, both of you just, just, I get so fired up, you know, I get so fired up. And, you know, one of the things as well that has made this divide so um, vast is that not only in my industry, you know, like back in the day, you could say that we were negotiating with studio heads, like creatives, actual creatives were there. Our industries now are being negotiated by corporations. <laughs> but like a sag after, we, we're just a, a part of a portfolio at this point where people are looking, a board of directors are looking at, at how they can trim the fat because it's gotten so, so far from the human contribution these conglomerates, these big, you know, everybody sees that you have CBS now, CBS Paramount, you have NBC and NBC Universal, and then those things are eating each other up. Warner Brothers Discovery. I mean, it's it's crazy. Those are corporations. There's no longer a human element to this in so many industries. So when that starts getting such a far divide, and we're only looking at spreadsheets now, and you're just looking at numbers and where you can adjust <laughs> numbers, and we're forgetting, not we, they are forgetting that those numbers are humans, human beings who are contributing to their wealth, to their wealth. And how is that possible that we are not compensated? That in the in billion dollar industries now, once again, billion dollar industries, they are going to tell us that they have no money to give you a raise. However, those same CEOs on top of their multi-million dollar salaries are getting multi-million dollar bonuses. This is where the disconnect is happening. It's we've we've gotten so far away from the human element of the uh, of truths about what we do and what we contribute to the workforce. That's now we're down. We're we're basically being diminished into numbers on a spreadsheet, and this is this has got to stop. And that's why twenty twenty three. We can't. We can't. If we continue on, I I you know I know for my vocate my industry in ten years being an artist will not be. A viable vocation, and you know, my I have, my two sisters are teachers. My husband's uh, brother is a teacher, and I can't even, you know, we have to support our teachers. We have to. They are one of the most valuable things uh, vocations in our world. They shape the the minds of our future, and yet they are paid so so disrespectfully. This has got to change. I mean, I wish that yes. people want to be actor, uh, be, want to be teachers more than they want to be actors. Being a teacher should be the the shiny object, not an actor. Yeah, so, Michelle, can I can, can I just ask something really quick before you go to your next question, Ms. Uh, sure. Patricia? A lot of this is tied into public policy, and I don't want to forget that, right? It's Absolutely. tied into lawmaking. It's tied into politics. It's tied into politicians, and you you see the attack and the assault from the ivory towers, from the state capitals. Uh, from the governors and from people who are running things with public policy because they're giving cover to CEOs. They're giving cover to these businesses and organizations. And Candace probably can speak much more eloquently than I can about this public policy piece. But 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 the framework around all of this is coming through politics. Yep. And so I always tell people, you know, we, we're going to fight like hell, but we have got to get in the game here. People, you know, people don't like to hear, oh, okay, just go vote. No, there's a lot more to 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 to, uh, to do it to do uh, before you get to that. There's voter education. There's voter advocacy. There is is all kinds of things that we've got to do on the street, knocking on doors, letting people know, staying on television, getting the messages out. But but we cannot release these politicians from from these CEOs because they are tied at the hip. They are tied at the hip. One begets power, begets power, begets power, and they're forgetting about the people who are right. actually running the organization. So I want people who are listening vast and wide to know that these politicians, we have to hold them accountable. If they're in office, whether they're Republican, independent or Democrat, they've got to be about people. They can't mm. produce an agenda 
that 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 people who you represent are are starving. This is America. We're not supposed to be this way. People are not supposed to. Yeah, anyway, I, I'm I'm gonna leave that alone. No, no, no. I want to. I want to build on that. I want to build on that because um we because we 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 understand what the what the problems are. I want to turn to solutions because the solutions mm -hmm. because the people are affected. The solutions also reside in the people. Um, and so we know that in some certain areas of the country, for example, um, in the South, where it is very difficult to uh, uh, establish union membership because of <laughs> right to work laws, um, that there are so many um, people who work in depressed under depressed wage conditions who are ununionized um, who also um, don't have good information on unions. Uh, so we know that people power is the solution. Yeah. What are some of the strategies uh, that have been identified that are good at bridging those information gaps, uh, whether you're talking about union organizing or a political and civic engagement uh, that will help build that coalition of support and bring more people into the labor movement. If if I can take the first Please. stab at that, uh, the AFL-CIO has something called the Southern Organizing Strategy, where we're focused on um, workers in the South and a lot and in right to work states. Because even though you're in a right to work state, it doesn't mean that you can't unionize. It means that there are more barriers to doing it. Uh, one of the biggest victories we've had recently was at a Bluebird bus um, factory in Georgia, and uh, it was a factory that's making uh, electric buses. So it's, you know, new technology, uh, green technology, and um, we we won this, this bargaining unit. It's a steel workers unit, and it was in Georgia where it's hard to organize, where um, people, re I mean, it is it is it is not easy to stand up and organize a, a, a union. It it isn't. It takes a lot. It takes support from from people all over the country, and it takes you know just just grit. And and I'm I'm sure Michelle, you know, you're on the you're on the picket line right now. It it takes a lot to be doing this work. Um, I know AFT. You you've had something like fifty five um six fifty five sixty new units um like organizing is happening and it's happening all over the country it's happening in places in blue states red states people are in favor of unions and it's it's a hard process and part of the thing that makes it so hard is that our laws do not support the workers organizing they make it as easy as possible for corporations to be obstructionist to not come to the table and bargain. There are 400, 400 uh, Starbucks around the country who have voted for a union and Starbucks will not sit down with them and negotiate a contract. And that's something that needs to stop. There needs to be more laws at a federal level that hold these corporations accountable when people say they want to unionize, when there's a campaign to unionize, we should make it so that there are no tax breaks for corporations that are anti-union. We should make sure that you know workers' rights are protected, that there is a path for people who, I mean, this is a democratic process. If you want a union, you should be able to get people together, hold an election and have a union and get a contract. It should be that simple. But what the, the, the relationship with corporations has done is it's put all of the power in the hands of the corporations and not enough power in the hands of the people. We are taking that power back for, for sure. But just like uh, Fed said, we really need the laws to support that. We need um, you know, the lawmakers at a state level, at a federal level, at a local level to understand that the costs of not accepting the union it, the costs of not being part of this movement are going to be higher than being part of it. Have you seen uh, Dr. Archer, you know, just drilling down on that a little bit more, um, the use of ballot initiatives uh, at the local level to focus on those tax incentives, um, particularly um, 
for corporations that refuse to bargain? Um, so we've seen most of this work starting to happen at the, the the national level, but it's about to get down to the state level. So one of the things that the Biden administration has done is it's passed three massive bills, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, and the CHIPS Act. And that will put literally billions of dollars into industry trying to, you know, during the pandemic, we all experienced the toilet paper shortages and, you know, couldn't find a car to buy the semiconductor because our supply chains fell apart. And those, in, those <clears throat> excuse me, investments are meant to bring jobs, good manufacturing jobs that the middle class was built on back to the United States and to encourage industry to locate here and to build, you know, factories and, and, and have good union jobs because union jobs are community supporting jobs. Mm -hmm. They're jobs that, that raise people's, um, people's life, uh, uh, standard of living, but also all of that comes out into the community, right? You get, if if a if a city is prosperous, you're going to have more teachers. You're going to have better schools. You're going to have. I mean, like it's just all going to build on itself. So yeah. we've seen at the national level a focus on trying to get the money to the states and and to corporations uh, and trying to put into some of those laws. Um, and if if you uh, you know. Are building a factory, you have to have a labor agreement with construction companies. So we're seeing that at at that level, um, and you know certainly in in certain states there's been um, advances for for helping uh, people organize. It's been a lot harder in states that are already right to work. It's but also fine. we've seen those laws overturned as well. In Michigan this year, the right to work laws oh. were overturned because we won. The we we meaning labor won the elections and overturned those those laws. So even a right to work state can not be a right to work state mm -hmm. if the right people are in power. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah. Hey, hey, Patrice, can I add to, uh, to the right conversation? Ahead. So 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 how? So I'm from Florida. I'm almost embarrassed to admit that these days, um, politically because it's so rough. Yeah. Right? We've got you know two people who are running for president in the same state who are just ripping the state apart. Um, mm -hmm. But, 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 but we are still fighting. We are still, and what I found that works and, and, and gets people in, you, we have to meet people where they are. Um, we cannot, uh, in school, they would tell me, keep it simple, stupid. Right. And mm -hmm. in, in my church, my, my pastor would say, make it plain. So, and in politics, they say kitchen table issues. Why is, why is it that you cannot pay your rent? and then start talking to people about that. Why is it that your aging parent is having such a hard time, you know, making it through because they can't afford pharmaceuticals? Why is it that your kid is having a rough time in mm -hmm. school? And let's talk about that and then talk about the policy. I, I find that if you talk about the policy first, then it disengages people. I think Michelle did a really good job at even educating me. I did not know 98% of the industry makes, you know, a certain amount of money. That is very plain to me. I, Cause when I think about sag after, you know, not the leader, right. But I'm thinking about Tom Hanks. I'm thinking about, you know, uh, whoever, all the other people I like, right. You know, and I'm thinking everybody's a millionaire in LA and that's what most people would think if they turn on the television. But when you start with those facts, when you meet people where they are and you tell them, there are a million people who work in this industry, just like teachers. We have an educational village. We have bus drivers. We have cafeteria workers. We have paraprofessionals. We have custodians. You can't run a school without a custodian. Guess what? We got kids. And guess what they do? They make a mess. That's their job. And so we've got people who are scratching pennies together to fix and clean schools every single day. But they're a vital part of who we are and what we do. And so we've got to do a better job at explaining that every day. When I go and get a haircut, I've got to explain to the brothers that, listen, the system is, is, is it was not necessarily built for us. The system has mm -hmm. not been good to us. But mm -hmm. here's how we can effectuate change. Right. And then, you know, we've got to help these sisters who have who have put America on their back and, mm -hmm. and tried to, uh, uh, to, 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 to engage in a political way of 
in, in an effort to keep people centered. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've got to get these sisters some help. And so mm -hmm. all of those things together, and then we've got to make sure that our Latin and Asian brothers and sisters understand that we're talking about their fight as well. Mm -hmm. Like anti-Semitic stuff is has no place in this country. Mm -hmm. Anti-Asian mm -hmm. hate has no place in this country because mm -hmm. if you go after them, they will come after you. And so mm -hmm. we've got to stop it where it is. It's systemic stupidity. You can call it racism. You can call it whatever it is. It is an uneducated way to deal with people who happen to look slightly different from you. Mm. That, that is the craziest assertion ever. And since we are in at the NAACP, I just want people to know that as a black man, I want the same thing that every other man wants for their child to be, that, that for my kid to be a little bit better than me. I want my kid to be able to pay their bills, get off my payroll. I want them to be able to get their own family. I want simple things in life, nothing more, nothing less. And I don't want that to take away from anybody else. But I still want my kids to have a fair shot in life. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not giving these kids, these young people, these working people a fair shot in life with public policies that continue to screw people over every single day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're doing it intently. It is intent. And that is going to crumple this democracy faster than we have ever seen it before if we don't stop this. We I must stop this. And so that's why this is important. Thank you, Patrice. No, I want to move to a, a really in, uh, important issue that you raised here because the, poli the the politics of division is something that has been effectively used over the history of this country, but we've seen such a drilling down on it um, over the past six years in the prior administration, um, whereas progress of people is really framed as a zero-sum game, um, you know, and really the issues are economic, but race is often used as a proxy to divert people's attention from the real issues at, at hand, which are uh, power, concentration of wealth, and who really benefits from uh, the benefits of their work and labor in society. Um, uh, what are some of the tools that you have uh, identified in bringing people together and helping um, communities to understand that their success is really rooted um, in uh, lifting everyone up and working collectively. You know the the most the the most important thing and the most powerful thing is education and information. You know people don't understand they won't step up. They understand they step up, and we have this crazy thing now social media, which is literally where ninety nine point nine 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 percent of us get information, and this is an amazingly powerful tool. This is how we can get to the youth because the youth are the most, that, that's tomorrow. <laughs> that's tomorrow. You know, they, we yeah. need them. And if they're educated, if they're informed, if they understand the battle that is their battle, they will rise. I do believe that whole thing of if you build it, they will come because they, they, they will understand it. It's just being able to reach out to find the access point of how they hear things, how they in, ingest information to make it simple, make it, uh, you know, John Lewis has a, a, a quote where he says, make it simple, make it um, plain, make it sing, right? That's what we have to do. We just need to make it as simple and plain and then let them sing it to the world. So this is the one of the most powerful tools that we have is information, amplification, because, you know, the truth of the matter is, and, you know, whether we want to believe this or not, but the, you know, the moral compass of this world, of us, particularly our country, has always moved on the backs of people of color. I'm just Amen. saying, we Amen. have, what we move, when we get over that line, everybody benefits. Right. It's not like we're like, we're going to do this. We want to get over here because so, we want the right to get married. We want the right to vote. We want the right to own a home. Those are everybody's rights. But we had to do this. We had to, you know, people were killed in order on our backs while we were trying to move that moral compass in this world. So what we're fighting for is we're fighting for everybody's existence here. It's that big. It's that important. And again, I don't mean to sound hyperbolic, but I am speaking truths. We are walking in these steps right now. 
one of the most powerful things we can do is amplification, information, education, and 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 encourage people to to get involved because this is impactful for everybody. Everybody. It's not. You know, this is not a mistake. This is not a, a by accident that this divide has happened. Right. You know, uh, Candace and Fred have both said we this is this is about who we have in offices right now. We need to be educated when we go to that ballot box. We need to understand who is fighting for the working class people and who is being paid to make this divide even bigger. So it's, you know, information, education, education, amplification, and then get people motivated. Go, fight. I really like that. Uh, information, education, amplification. That's, uh, that's, those are, those are, that's a really good uh, way of keeping it simple and, and explaining things to people. Um, I want to turn for a minute to uh, some of the, back to the policy discussion and workers. Um, you know, because I, I uh, noted that at the end of, of August, the Department of Labor um, has proposed making any workers that make less than 55000 annually eligible for overtime. When I was working in Congress, that was a battle that, um, you know, the classification of workers, I mean, that's, you know, really um, important both for uh, whether people are employees or independent contractors, but also how they're classified and whether they're eligible for overtime. Um, so that is going to be uh, a useful, very useful policy um, mm. if that rulemaking goes through, making more people, like 3.6 million people, more eligible uh, for overtime. Um, Fed, uh, let's start with you. So uh, as, a, as a union that represents teachers, are there any other specific policies that you see as having uh, the largest impact on your workforce? Yeah, yeah. Let, now, let me start off with the PRO Act. Let, let, uh, let's get it done. Uh, let, let's make it easier to unionize for everybody, because the more unions we have, the stronger our democracy will be. Um, and, and I say that in the same breath, and I don't want to be partisan here, because I think there's still a lot of work to do. But coming from the last, prior administration, what we've seen in the Biden administration has been um, helpful. Uh, and so I want, you know, starting with his secretary of labor, Marty Walsh, who, who just left us recently, Julie Sue has continued in that same vein. The Biden administration has tried to be uh, very helpful in what they can do. They're limited in what they can do uh, because we need Congress to act. We need our senators to act. We need um, our, our House of Representatives to get their uh, house in order and, and move in a way that represents people. And so um, I think organizing as a whole will help us um, in terms of edu education. We, you know, we, we're under so many attacks right now um, as, as though we're not doing our jobs. I, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a, a metaphor here um, and, and take you back, you know, to a high school graduation. You know how you see some black families and they go crazy at these high school graduations. They have bullhorns, they have party favors, you know, and all the administrators are telling them to shush, shush and, and hush up. I, I never do that. And I always, and I don't encourage us to, you know, act out in, in, a, in a way, but what that represents is the hope in, in life. That's, that's the dad and the mom who is one generation removed from illiteracy. Who their grandmother signed their name with an X. They weren't able to go to college. And now they want to put this kid through. And that's the hope and life of a community. And it comes out because people see it in that way. That we need to take that moment mm. in a high school graduation where families lose their ever loving mind for something good and channel that and help that and promote that. You know, when you hold a baby in your in your hand and you see the lights come on and you start talking a whole different language, God, God, Google, and it makes you happy inside. That's the hope mm. that if that could promote public policy for education, we'd have a better world. Mm. That, let, let's do everything we can for that little kid that you're holding who's two days old. It, let's do everything that we possibly can. That is the hope hope and that's the policies that we need so i could go into detail but i wanted to give you those two anecdotes because that's what we do every day in classrooms we're trying our best we're trying our hardest 
with 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 few resource few resources with people who don't support us and and it's impacting every single work sector in America. If we don't get educators right, if we don't take care of our kids, if we don't protect public education, then let me tell you something, we won't have much. We won't have much and CEOs they can wait on it. But yeah. our kids will take care of us one way or another. This is such a compelling discussion. And Patrice, thank you so much. I want to open it up actually now to the four of you. So we do have a Q&A. And oh my gosh, you all the amazing questions that have come through. But I'm going to choose one because I want to tip you all off your game because <laughs> you're ready to go. So um, we have Stefan Coward. He is actually with the Hip Hop Caucus. And so very different views on how we look at labor. And again, back to what you were saying, Michelle, this way of how we think about actors and actresses making these phenomenal paychecks, and that's not the case. And his question is, my question, do you believe that hip hop culture can add value to this fight? If so, how do you think that could support your action? Oh my goodness, of course, absolute art. <laughs> Art, art, it's the universal language. It hits people beyond, you know, across the pond. It hits the whole entire world. I would love art, hip hop artists and a, a bunch of hip hop, hip hop artists already doing this, but please, you know, drop some, you know, drop some tunes about some, about what, what's happening in the labor union. Let's make some music so that people have it in their, their heads and they're singing this song and they don't even realize that they're literally singing songs about how there's a divide between the CEOs and the working class. Absolutely, hip hop, you know, community is is strong and powerful and large. I would be super happy to engage you guys and get you guys out there. And you know, you guys have already been out there on on uh, picket lines. I've been walking with hip hop artists on on some of our our uh, picketing lines in New York and L.A. Absolutely, please, you know, whatever is inspiring you about this conversation, write some, write a song, get it out there. That's how powerful you guys are. You're really powerful. I, I I look at it also from the, the 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 standpoint of you know you know you know kids are sponges, um, mm. and I'm sure everyone has a parent that has said at one point you know if you knew those books like you knew those lyrics of that song maybe you'd be doing better <laughs> on your test. Um, right. But you know you know we have a like a fight in Florida um, about and across the country um, where critical race theory has been mischaracterized um, where the um, uh, AP Advanced African American History Curriculum in uh, Florida uh, was rejected. Um, what I would love to see is, you know, in efforts to suppress history and the holistic teaching of history, that we uh, adapt those curricula in ways that are um, easily accessible. Um, you know, I still remember and love Schoolhouse Rock. That hasn't been updated in uh, 40, 50 years, you know, but look at how kids who listened to Hamilton began to like rap Hamilton, like, you know, much, much better than I could having the recording. Uh, they just pick it up. I mean, I think that in efforts to suppress the holistic teaching of history, we should make it um, the anti-democracy movement's worst nightmare when scores of kids are rapping about history and culture and really telling the truth about it. Mm. Love that. Yeah. So I'm going to sum up with one more question. And so um, I'm going to choose one in regards to uh, Ken Bryant, who had sent in, are boycotts being discussed against companies that refuse to sit down with unions? That's a great question because that's about mobilization and advocacy. So I'm going to say it again. Are boycotts being discussed against companies that refuse to sit down with unions? And um, Dr. Archer, because you have an economy background, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then, of course, open it to the group. Well, I mean, it's a little complicated, right? Because, for example, um, you know, Netflix is a, a, a place where a lot of artists are able to practice their art. And I don't think artists want Netflix to go out of business, but they certainly would love to see some pressure put on them so that, you know, they get to the table and they actually negotiate uh, with SAG-AFTRA. 
Uh, same thing with Starbucks, right? Like we 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 don't want people to lose their jobs. We don't want corporations to you know be in a position where they're saying, well, you know, the the unions put us out of business, and and you know it's the union's fault that we don't have Starbucks anymore. Um, so it's it's you know it's complicated, um, but. Uh, I do think that as individuals, we can certainly, you know, walk into a Starbucks and say, can I speak to the manager and uh, hi manager, I really want you to know that I support the workers. Hmm. Uh, during the Walmart fight for 15, where we were fighting for a, um, a uh, 15, 15 an hour minimum wage, we're still fighting for in a lot of places for a minute, $15 an hour minimum wage. Um there wasn't an, people weren't encouraged to not go to Walmart. They were encouraged to go to Walmart and tell managers, this is what I want this company to do. Mm-hmm. So um, everybody can be in the fight. You can walk the line with uh, Michelle. You can go out when your teachers go on strike. You can walk the line with them. You can go support them. You can, you can be part of this movement, even if you're not in a union and be clear that this is what you want these corporations to do, um, which may be as effective as a boycott. Uh, it's just it's just hard to say. Yeah, can, can I can I just add also that so I'm a high school teacher, so sometimes I talk like the kids. They you know they they would tell you that there are levels to this, right? And 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 they would tell you to trust the process because boycotts and strikes are last line of defense. No, nobody wants to get there. No, no, nobody ever wants to get the civil rights movement taught us that, right? The most famous boycott is the Montgomery bus boycott. But that was an escalation of mm-hmm. what had happened, you know, throughout a couple years of what was going on. Remember, those folks got water hosed and dogs and 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 the whole not. I mean, there, there was a lot that led to that. So I think anytime you talk boycotts and you talk strikes, you're, yeah. you're putting lives on the line, you're putting organizations on the line. You're putting money on the line. There's a financial impact, absolutely, but there's an escalation in education, just like Michelle talked about earlier. That you you have to make sure that people understand what they're doing, have a ground floor, have a strategy to get there, have an exit strategy, and then know a deal when you see it. Those are some of the things that we talk about as leaders of unions all the time. I don't think we're ever afraid of a boycott. We're never afraid of a strike, but we've got to educate people on how you get there and how you get out of that and then how you 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 make sure you protect your people who are actually taking those bold stands as well so i think you know we we should never shy away from that particular talk but we should always try to educate people on how you deal with the historical vantage point of boycotts what that means you know florida we have a travel advisory from the naacp it is not a boycott of Florida. No. It is a travel advisor. So that's an escalation. That is mm. a that that is a strategy, a, a very right. smart strategy, I might add, to 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 say, hey, be aware, understand, if you're going to go to Florida, and we're not telling you not to go, but there's some things down there that you need to have your eyes wide open. And mm. so those kinds of things we need to continue to talk and educate the populace on when people talk about boycotts and strikes and all of these last line of defense things. Mm. That's... The Fed, Mich- oh, sorry, Michelle. No, no, uh, I was going to say, you know, exactly what they said. And I love, Candace, I never even thought about like, you know, telling people to, you know, because I always say about amplifying, right? Getting the, 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 the message out there. But I love that. I love actually um, contacting these people and saying, by the way, I don't like what you're doing to your workers. I don't appreciate this. Let the, yeah. you know, our, we're powerful people. <laughs> we are powerful and your voice matters and your voice can change the world. So going into like a Starbucks talk, telling, you know, a, a board of education that they should pay their teachers, telling CEOs that they need to pay their artists. This is this is an amazing way. And yes, we've chatted about like, you know, possibly calling, you know, uh, the people to cancel subscriptions for a month and another thing. But just like Bed said, it's an escalation. And those those options are on the table and we may pull that trigger, but it comes at a, you know, knowing your strategy in and your strategy out. And just because I am the daughter of civil rights activists and I and I constantly will quote, you know, the glorious words of people. Again, I will say another one from John Lewis. <laughs> Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. 
Ours is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime. Never be afraid to make some noise and get into trouble, necessary trouble, good trouble. And that's what we do as unionists. That's what we do. Yeah, Michelle, that is so powerful. We all believe in the good trouble. So um, we're going to end our call. It's 8.01. We're one minute behind. on. But I do want to just also give some words of wisdom. So Fed, in our Q&A, we had someone say, as a member of the United Teachers of Dade and the NAACP, I am so very proud of your advocacy. Dr. Ingram, thank you. So, um, and so we also had some other great questions. Um, oh, another one is Canada also issued an official advisory warning to your words in Florida. And then we had some great feedback from Chairwoman Robin Williams, who is our national committee chair for the NAACP. And she said that she loved the conversation and thank you all for the energy and the steering on this panel. She is very happy and pleased with all of the great and phenomenal work you all did today on this call. So I wanna thank Dr. Archer, Michelle Hurd, Fed, Patrice, again, for a powerful discussion as we wrap up Labor Action Week and we're coming towards an end. Um, you all and what you do, continue to fight for the rights of workers, Black workers, Black and Brown people is completely an honor to have you all on the call. Um, I'm going to go ahead, Lindsay, if you want to put my email in the chat, feel free, uh, folks who did not get their questions answered or folks who would just like to connect with us on Labor Action feel free to email me directly as we're working on that on a national framework. And again, thanks everyone for your time. Thanks everyone for your um, for your great questions. And thanks to our panelists. We are really excited to have you all tonight and good night. Thanks guys. <laughs>